In this tutorial we will look at digestion. The first aim is to explain the function of the organs in our digestive system, then explain how we can practically investigate digestion, and then explain examples of functional foods. This topic should help you get some perspective on two expressions we humans commonly use. The first expression is, I'm starving. Now we all say it when we're feeling a bit hungry, but what is starvation? If you actually understand what starvation is, it might prompt you to rethink your use of that expression. This sorry sight is a horse I encountered on holiday, and I was so distressed by its lack of health that I felt compelled to feed it every day I was there. This horse is on the brink of advanced starvation, although it's not quite there yet. You see, in an effort to gain energy, your body will metabolize glucose. This glucose we get from our food, but when that glucose runs out, our body starts to feed on our glycogen reserves. Glycogen is a molecule we store on our body. It's essentially small glucose molecules stitched together. When glycogen reserves run out, then we start feeding on our proteins and fat reserves. If after a week or two we still haven't received any food, our body has started to break down so much of our internal tissue that even if we are fed after this point, we would not be able to survive. And that's because our body's actually digested the very system that is used to digest food. In other words, during advanced starvation, your body starts to digest its own gut. So think about that next time you say you're starving. You're probably way off. You see, the gut develops very early on in embryonic development. What happens is that little ball of cells develops a cavity, a hole, which basically travels throughout the entire cluster of cells. This hole is called a blastopore. Some animals, like jellyfish, don't have the hole continuing throughout. Instead, it's just a cavity. But for most animals, we have a blastopore. Nine months later, that blastopore has developed into a gut. A gut is essentially a hollow tube that runs throughout your body around which you are formed. Other organs may feed into the gut, such as the pancreas, the liver and the gallbladder, but the gut itself is just a hollow tube. So next time someone says, I hate your guts, don't take it too personally. They're referring to an empty space, not you. The digestive system is one of those typical cases in biology where you say what you see and explain what it does. It's not particularly difficult, but this topic does feature heavily in the B2 exam. Many six markers have come from digestive system questions. The digestive system has many parts, and they follow a sort of order as food travels from one checkpoint to the next checkpoint. For this reason, I like to teach the digestive system as if it were a tube map. Now, the digestive system tube map has three lines. I'm going to name them the central line, that represents the main gut that travels throughout our body. The enzyme line, which you'll see why in a bit, because most enzymes come into the system from this stop here. And the bile line. Enzymes and bile are sort of added into a gut as we go along. The goal of the digestive system is to convert long molecules, insoluble molecules such as starch, into small, simple, soluble molecules such as glucose, so they can pass through the semi-permeable wall of the small intestine and get into our bloodstream, where we can make use of this food. So these large molecules are broken down in steps by our digestive system. And as we go from stop to stop, we will look at these steps as if they were sightseeing attractions near a tube station. There are two types of digestion that occur. The white represents physical digestion, that's when food is physically broken up. And the coloured words represent chemical digestion. There are a number of different chemicals involved and I've given them different colours so you can tell them apart. So let's start with the mouth. So we're here with our digestive system. Two processes occur in the mouth. The first is mastication. This is a posh word for chewing. We chew food to break it down so the food has a larger surface area upon which chemicals can act. It's a bit like the body's pestle and mortar. Secondly, we have an enzyme being secreted. This enzyme is called amylase and it's released by the salivary glands into the mouth. The job of amylase is to convert starch into a simpler sugar called maltose. But to keep things simple and relevant to your specification, I'm just going to call it glucose here. It's just a simple sugar. Amylase is an example of a carbohydrate, an enzyme that has evolved to break down carbohydrates. It's not the only carbohydrate digesting enzyme, but it's the only one you need to know of. So in an exam, they ask you to explain or describe the role of a carbohydrate. The one you'll be talking about is amylase, and it converts starch to glucose. Next stop is the esophagus. The esophagus is the food pipe that connects your mouth to your stomach. 
The esophagus, like the rest of the gut, uses a process called peristalsis to move food along the gut. In the process, it also mechanically breaks it down slightly. The esophagus is made of two types of muscles. You have longitudinal muscles here in pink and circular muscles here in yellow. The circular muscles contract behind the food, pushing it down the elementary canal or the gut whereas longitudinal muscles have a wave of contraction that travels ahead of the food. This helps maintain the food's ball shape as it travels down the gut. These muscular contractions are involuntary, we do not have to think about it. And even if you turned yourself upside down and stood on your head, the peristalsis would still work pushing the food towards your stomach. The peristalsis can be modelled very easily using a ball and a stocking. All you have to do is use your hands to pinch behind the ball with the stocking and move the ball down. It's simple. Sometimes you can even feel peristalsis at work. For example, when you eat a crisp and it goes down the wrong way and you slowly feel it sort of scrape against your esophagus as it travels down to your stomach. Next up, we have the stomach. The stomach is essentially a bag of acid, but it's made of muscles and they can contract to pummel the food and break it down further. The acid in our stomach, which happens to be hydrochloric acid, has a pH value of two, it's highly acidic. And this chemically breaks down the food as well, which also helps increase the surface area on which enzymes can act. Now here's the second enzyme you need to know, pepsin. Now pepsin is an example of a protease, whereas amylase was an example of a carbohydrate. Pepsin breaks down proteins into amino acids. These are soluble molecules, this is insoluble. Next up, we have the small intestine. Now this is the most important point in the digestive system, just over here below the stomach where this orange sort of tubing is. I put an image of a gun here because essentially it's an all out assault on food at this point. The body throws every weapon it has against food to try and break it down because beyond this point, if food isn't small enough, it won't be absorbed into our bloodstream where we can make use of it. Now I will go on to explain what happens in small intestine, but I think it's important we understand two of the other lines first. So firstly, let's look at the bile line. The first organ is the liver. You can see the liver on the diagram here. Now the liver produces bile. Bile is an emulsifier of fats. Let me show you an example of what I mean. It's a well-known fact that fats and water don't mix. Oil and water will separate, even if you shake them. But if you add a bit of fairy liquid and shake it again, you'll see a different story. Now the fats and water are miscible, they're mixed in together. You see, bile acts like the body's washing up liquid. Bile will allow the fat to be broken down to small droplets where the enzymes in the watery-like fluid around it can now interact with it and help break it down. Basically, bile breaks down fats to give them a large surface area. The next stop is the gallbladder, where bile is actually stored. You can't see the gallbladder very clearly on this picture, but if you have a look here, it's just there. So remember, the liver produces bile, but the gallbladder stores it. Like your bladder stores urine, the gallbladder stores bile. As well as emulsifying fats, allowing them to be broken down by lipase, the fat digesting enzyme, bile is also alkaline and it neutralizes stomach acid. So bile is injected into the base of the stomach where it meets the small intestine to neutralize the stomach acid. You see, your stomach holds a very potent acid but your stomach is lined with cells which secrete a mucus that stop the acid damaging your stomach cells. Other organs do not have these cells, so if the acid were to leak into other organs, it would start to digest them and it would be very, very painful. This is why a stomach gunshot is one of the most painful places to be shot, as the acid starts to leak and digest other organs. So having this alkali bile being introduced at this point will neutralize the stomach acid so you don't feel any pain in your small intestine. Now let's look at the other line, the enzyme line. Now you have seen enzymes being introduced by other organs along the gut, but most of them come from the pancreas. The pancreas is a feather-like organ. You can see this green organ here, I've drawn it here as well in yellow, which basically feeds into the base of the stomach where it meets the small intestine. The pancreas produces three enzymes, amylase, which we've already seen, another protease called trypsin, though you don't need to know it by name, it digests proteins, and lipase, the fat digesting enzyme. Think of lip as in liposuction, lipids, these are words for fat. And notice how they end in A's. Remember, ASE, ASE, ASE means enzyme. The pancreas, if you want to think about it like this, injects these enzymes into the small intestine where they become active and can break down food. So now we can talk about what goes on in the small intestine. Amylase becomes active in the small intestine and helps in the breakdown of starch to glucose. 
Protease becomes active in the small intestine in the form of trypsin and it helps break down proteins into amino acids and lipase also becomes active in the small intestine breaking down fat molecules into fatty acids and glycerol. You see proteins and starch form long chain molecules like this and when the enzyme acts on them turns them into small soluble molecules. Fat molecules aren't organized in the same way. They have four components. One is a molecule of glycerol and then you have three fatty acid chains. Lipase simply breaks them up into three fatty acids and a glycerol. These are just names you have to remember, nothing more. Now for the higher level bit, and this is probably the most popular question on the B2 higher paper, asking how the small intestine is adapted for absorption. It's normally about three marks. There are three features a small intestinal wall has. If you were to zoom in on the intestinal wall, you'd see it's divided into finger-like projections called villi. And then if you were to zoom into each villi, you'd see each villi has finger-like projections called microvilli. Microvilli create a large surface area, that's my abbreviation, not one you can use in an exam, a large surface area for the rapid absorption of soluble food molecules. Think of a towel. A towel has hair-like extensions on it. If it didn't, it wouldn't dry you very well. That's because it can absorb water very quickly, just like this can absorb soluble molecules very quickly. The surface layer of the villi is one cell thick. This provides a very short diffusion pathway, so basically these soluble molecules diffuse very quickly. They don't have to spend a lot of time battling their way through many cells. And finally, you can see here, there's a good blood supply via a capillary network. Again, this allows soluble materials to be transported away very quickly, maintaining a concentration gradient so it can continue to diffuse through. The last stop is the large intestine, this green tube here. Large intestine receives anything that hasn't been absorbed by the small intestine and will now be passed out the body as waste. One more thing happens in large intestine, water is reabsorbed. So if our body's short on water, it'll be reabsorbed from the food back into the bloodstream. So here's the whole map and you can see how the different parts link in. It's a handy way of thinking about it for the memory. Understanding the roles and activity of the enzymes is critically important for this exam. Here's a summary table to help you. Remember, amylase, converts starch into glucose. It is produced in two places, the salivary glands and the pancreas. Where it's produced by the salivary glands, it's active in the mouth. Where it's produced by the pancreas, it's active in the small intestine. Amylase works best in neutral conditions, in other words, pH 7. Protease converts proteins to amino acids. One form of protease, pepsin, is produced in the stomach, whereas another, called trypsin, is produced in the pancreas. Pepsin is active in the stomach, whereas other proteases are active in the small intestine. Pepsin has an optimum pH of 2, that's why it can exist in the stomach, whereas other proteases have an optimum pH of 7, that's why they're best suited to the small intestine, which has neutral conditions. Lipase converts fats into fatty acids and glycerol, produced by the pancreas, active in the small intestine, and have an optimum pH of 7. Some questions might ask you to observe the activity of an enzyme at a range of pH values. If you were given a picture like this, you could say, well, this enzyme must have an optimum pH of 7, and therefore it could be amylase or lipase. You understand that it's most reactive here because most products are being made in the form of some gas. As you deviate away from neutral conditions, their optimum pH, you can see the rate of reaction goes down, there's less activity, and then 3 and 11, you can assume the enzyme has denatured completely because there are no bubbles whatsoever, nothing's being produced. And that is how you explain the function of the organs in our digestive system. Now let's look at how we can investigate enzymes. To do this, we can actually model the small intestine using visking tubing. A model is when we use an object to represent something else, so it can help us understand how it might work. Now, visking tubing is a good representation for a small intestine because only small molecules can get through it. You see, it's semi-permeable. It's basically just a plastic tubing with pores in it. However, it's much smaller than the gut. It has no villi, it has no capillaries, so it's not perfect as a representation. So if you had to evaluate the model gut, this is what you could say. The experiment would work a little bit like this. You'd open up your visking tubing and inside you'd put a starch amylase solution. You can see here we have long molecules of starch and we have amylase as well. Hopefully you can see that starch cannot leave the visking tubing because it's just too big. In other words, it's insoluble. What we do now is transfer our visking tubing into a boiling tube filled with water. This water represents our bloodstream. If you wanted to make this model more accurate, you could heat the water to 37 degrees Celsius. So the visking tubing is our gut and the water inside the boiling tube represents our blood. 
Now you need to use two different chemicals. One is called Benedict's reagent and the other one's called iodine, which you're probably more familiar with. Iodine detects for the presence of starch and turns a bluish blackish color when it does, whereas Benedict's reagent will turn a brick ready orange color if it detects sugar. So right at the start of the experiment, take a sample of the water, not the starch amylase solution, that's sealed, just the water. And then you drop some of that water into the Benedict's reagent and some of it into the iodine. After zero minutes, you would expect no change in either of these. And that's because starch is too big to leave the visking tubing, so it will not be present in the water, and there's no sugar made. But we are now going to leave it for 15 minutes and test it again. In the meantime, I want to show you what's going on inside. You see, after 15 minutes, amylase will have had enough time to start breaking down the starch into single glucose molecules. And these glucose molecules are small enough to leave the visking tubing and enter our model bloodstream, the water. So now when we test it again, we will have sugar in our water. You need to heat Benedict's solution up a little bit to make it work a bit faster. But with sugar in there, it will turn a brick red sort of orangey color. Iodine, however, will remain brown because there is no starch in the water, only glucose. You can then repeat this uh, experiment and change the enzyme concentration and then work out a relationship. Now, if you've seen the enzyme tutorial on limiting factors, you'll understand this graph immediately. Basically, the higher the enzyme concentration, the more quickly starch gets broken down into sugar. But this only happens up to a point. If you remember, enzymes work by bonding their active site with the substrate so they can break it down. Now, if there's only a limited amount of substrate, then all those substrates will be occupying an active site and you can keep on adding more enzymes, but it won't do any good because there's no substrate to be broken down. They're all being used. So by this point, you can assume that substrate concentration is the limiting factor. We need to increase the substrate to increase the rate of reaction. And that is how you explain how we can practically investigate digestion. Lastly, we're going to look at functional foods. This could form another six mark question potentially. Um, basically, functional foods are foods with a health benefit and there are three types you need to know. Probiotics, prebiotics and plant stanol esters. Probiotics are often given the term good bacteria. Basically, they're live bacteria that you'd commonly find in your gut, such as bifidobacteria and lactobacillus. These bacteria are great because they basically stay in your gut, taking up space and reducing the chance of harmful bacteria colonizing your gut. They also produce healthy products which we can use, such as vitamin K. So they maintain a healthy digestive system and immune system. Eating live yogurts is an excellent way of consuming probiotics. Prebiotics are also given the term oligosaccharide. These are basically food for the good bacteria to encourage their growth. We can't really get enough prebiotics in our normal diet, so often people can take supplements. But typical dietary sources of prebiotics are leeks, onions and oats. Finally, plant stanol esters are chemicals that lower blood cholesterol and therefore reduce the risk of heart disease, one of the biggest killers of humans. Now the problem is plant stanol esters aren't found in abundance in plants, so we have to synthesize them industrially. We use bacteria to do this. Bacteria are used to convert the plant fat sterile into stanol as they occur naturally in low quantities. You can commonly find plant stanol esters as an added ingredient to margarines and spreads. And that's how we explain examples of functional foods.